Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Horton. I work in research and development at Avocare, and I'm here with Aaron Williams, Director of Marketing at Avocare. And it's my pleasure to have Dr. Leanne Redman. She's a member of our Scientific and Medical Advisory Board, and she's a leading expert in weight management and has so many different things to add today. So I'm excited to have her. Um, and the last time we spoke, we spoke about the definition of obesity, as well as talking about um, the readiness for change, so the different stages for change. But I want to shift gears just a little bit and now talk about um, a little bit more about the markers for success, because once we start to get that maintenance and to check, it's time for us to start figuring out what are our markers for success. So Dr. Redmond, welcome again, and it's good to have you here again with us to talk about this. And I'd love to hear how you manage to um, work in markers for success for your patients at your clinic. Mm -hmm. Hey, Lauren. Hey, Aaron. I have, to start, I have to start there. So it's a great transition, right? After we've started thinking about, you know, where somebody might be in their journey and if they're ready to start or not. And now we have somebody that's ready to embark on a behavior change program that involves a diet or healthy eating component that involves a physical activity component. Maybe it involves changing to their sleep habits as well, and maybe it involves um, taking some supplements. So in this person's program, it's quite holistic, right? So we can't just, you know, pack them up on a journey and see them in, in 30 days from now. We need to make a plan to help them monitor their progress, and we need to have a plan for our check-in. And not only do we need to have a plan for our check-ins, we need to be able to help them interpret all the information that they're going to be tracking. So our feedback is going to be key to their success. So if we think about all those different factors, a uh, healthy eating plan, a physical activity plan, maybe a sleep hygiene plan. We didn't talk about stress management, but that can come in. And a supplement plan. You know, what are the different ways that we can track all those things? So we have a lot of tools that are available to us. Um, probably the most valuable tool available to the person who's undergoing the journey is some kind of journal. Now, it can be a pen and paper, old school journal. It can be your notes, you know, app or whatever on your phone or your tablet or whatever the case may be. Or you can actually incorporate uh, journaling and note taking or tracking in a number of, of different uh, apps. So let's talk first of all um, about diet. So one of the things that we need to keep track on or that's been shown to be important to track um, is not necessarily the calories, um, but even just keeping track of a meal plan. So let's just say we want to increase our, uh, the quality of our diet. So that would mean maybe it's cutting out sugar-sweetened beverages. Maybe it's reducing the amount of fat that we're eating. Maybe it's increasing lean sources of proteins. Whatever the case may be, having some kind of checklist where you're putting in at the beginning of the week the kind of items that you're wanting to eat at breakfast, the kind of items that you're wanting to eat at lunch and dinner, and then the snacks in between. Having a checklist at the start of the week where you can just come along and check off that you're, you're on plan and you're following program can be sufficient. Research studies show actually that it doesn't really matter what people track with regard to the diet. Like you don't have to calorie count. You don't have to worry about grams of sugar. You don't have to worry about grams of fat. The studies show it doesn't really matter what it is that you're tracking as long as you're tracking something, right? So that's really important, right? So when we set out on a change, on a plan to change our, our weight, let's, well, I'm assuming it's weight loss and not weight gain. We get so fixated, right, often on the calories. I'm only going to eat 1,800 calories. And I can't tell you how many times when people come into the clinic and they'll be maybe 220 pounds, which for some people is 50 pounds overweight, but for some people it's 80 or 100 pounds overweight. And they'll tell you and they'll be dead serious, honest, and they'll show you on their tracking apps on their phone, they're only eating 1,200 calories a day. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you if I was to give them 1,200 calorie a day diet that I'm providing from our kitchen here, 
those people would lose weight. Now, why is that? Why is there such a disagreement between the information that we're getting from these things that we're using for tracking and like what's actually being eaten? So there's a couple reasons for that. And one is that people, as people, we're just not very good at, at tracking calories, right? Now, why would that be? Well, the main reason is, and this is also from research studies, is that we're not good at measuring portion sizes and we're not good at reading uh, food labels. Absolutely. So let's just think about a couple of food items. I don't have any here in front of me, but let's just take um, a yogurt, for instance. It comes in a prepackaged container. It's little. And when you read the label, it tells you exactly the number of calories in that one single serving. But let's just take a different example. Maybe it's a bag of popcorn. So now you have a, a bag of popcorn that's this big. And when you're reading the label, it tells you how many grams of popcorn are in each serving. But one single serving is not the entire bag. So mm -hmm. now you have to kind of figure out, oh my goodness, how many kernels of popcorn are in one single serving? And so we just don't do that as people. So we're not very accurate in understanding how many or how much of something that we've eaten. And when we're putting it in the app, we make a lot of mistakes. And that's true even for dietitians. So there was a really cool study that they did here uh, at Pennington many years ago now, about 10 years ago. And they took people, trained dietitians, like this is their job, is to know how to keep a food record. And even people that are highly trained in keeping food records were not able to accurately estimate the number of calories that they were being fed in a controlled uh, study. And in fact, they were off by about 15% of their, of their estimation every day. Now, if we're not trained, you could imagine our error in estimating is a lot more than that. It's about 30% off. So the, my point for that, that story or little uh, tidbit scientific fact um, was just to let you know it, it doesn't matter exactly. It doesn't have to be precise if you're measuring 1,200 calories a day, 1,500 calories a day. The point is, is that we're actually tracking. And the best approach is to track against a checklist. And the checklist was developed in a way to ensure that you're going to meet your healthy diet goals. So that's the point for diet. Okay, so I was going to ask you a question. When you were talking, I was like, oh, I wonder. So for someone that has um, been eating an unhealthy diet for, you know, years, would they want to start off with something that's drastically different or would they want to modify their diet in stages? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of philosophies on that. So it's going to really depend on the person, to be honest. Yeah. And some of this gets back to the that great big question is a calorie a calorie right so when we want to change our body weight what matters at the end of the day every day and every day in the week and then every day in the month is whether we can achieve an imbalance between what we eat which would be less and what we burn which would be more so if we can achieve this gap between what's coming in our body calories and what's going out then we can dig into the energy that's in our body fat stores and we can lose weight over time, right? So the reason I'm saying it comes down to is a calorie a calorie because what might be important for one person could be reducing the amount of carbohydrate. And that's often associated with sugar intake. So for somebody, their focus might be just simply to reduce the amount of sugar sweetened beverages. So adding sugar to their tea or coffee or drinking, yeah, drinking sweet tea or drinking soda. So that could be a really successful strategy for a person that has a high intake of carbohydrates and sugar. And that one simple change might be enough to accelerate that gap between what's going in and what's going out and to put them on a successful journey for weight loss. Whereas another person may tell you, um, you know, during the stages of change interview that you do, um, that they struggle with eating on the go. Right, And we often know if we're eating on the go, that often means stopping on the way home, grabbing something, maybe at a convenience store or a fast food restaurant. And we know that those food items that we grab on the go tend to be high in fat, high in saturated fat, very calorie dense, and often high in sodium, right? Salt. Yeah. 
So for that person, right, your dietary strategy is going to be really different. You're going to help that person meal plan, right, so that they don't have to be eating on the go because they're prepared now. And the meals that you're going to coach them to make are going to be naturally lower in, in saturated fat, and then they're going to be less calorically dense. So we have two different people that have, have shared with you two different reasons that um, they feel that their diet is unhealthy and could be improved. And just by changing those two separate things can really propel that person onto a successful journey for weight management. So I think that's really important um, to talk about and to think through because it doesn't have to be everything at one time. We don't have to cram in six to eight pieces of fruits and vegetables every day. We don't have to cram in, you know, a lean protein at lunch and a lean protein at dinner. It, the strategy doesn't have to be that drastic for every single person. I will. I have a question. Um, do you, when you were talking about um, the importance of tracking or just tracking something, mm -hmm. uh, and you, you mentioned it last time, like when you're tracking something, um, it can be good to go back and see kind of the effort that you've already put in. When someone's either new at tracking just their meal plan or if they're struggling with it, do you have like tips or, or in that or ways that you motivate people who are maybe struggling to keep everything going during the day? Yeah, that's excellent. And, you know, that's why I say a checklist rather than trying to log food. Logging food works really well for people, but let's face it, we get fatigued at doing that. And now we call it app fatigue, but it used to just be journaling fatigue or tracking fatigue. And you'll see it, right? So the first couple of days, it's all neat and it's structured and it's easy to follow. And then by the end of the week, it's just little scribbles. And then the next week, it might just be here or there. <laughs> so I, I do this. Yeah. <laughs> we all do that. Like, let's face it. And then over time, we think, oh, I don't need to track anymore. And that's actually probably really true, but it's actually not based on science. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. And so, yes, we need to be the cheerleaders. We need to remind people that when they were tracking, that they were having the most success. Because I absolutely promise you, in the early days, right, we know that early wins are critical. We know that we need to see some positive benefits to all this effort of our behavior change in those first 30 days, even shorter than that, if we can see people more often. But in a study, it's usually two, to, two weeks to four weeks. An early win is critical. Mm. And if you go back to the early stages, it's usually where the person has much more program support. The check-ins are more often, they're tracking more often, they're getting feedback more often. And so what else is happening in that early stage? They're seeing a benefit, right? Their weight, their weight is coming down. So it's critical to journal because it does provide what we called last week self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is basically the skill that people learn to troubleshoot on their own. And so that's what you're trying to teach people. You're trying to teach people to be able to recognize when things are hot, when I'm hot, when things are good, like what are all the factors that are contributing to that? And when I'm falling off the program, you know, well, what, are the, what was the trigger? And, you know, then over time they start to learn how to manage the triggers and to manage the success all on their own. But in the beginning, often as the coach, we have to point those, those things out. Yep. So tracking is key. So we didn't talk about um, tracking weight, I know, yet. And we do. We do do that. And we think it's very important. And I know last time we talked, we did talk a little bit about tracking of weight. But we've Diet is important, obviously, because that's what we're putting in our mouth. And obviously, it's what's going impact, to impact weight. But we always say that the scale doesn't lie. And we need to think about that for a minute, right? So when you lose, when you lose weight, if you lose one pound, about 75%, two-thirds to 75% of the weight that you lose is body fat. It, it is. And that's been shown time and time and time again. A smaller amount is water, and then a, a small amount is muscle. And so often, even if we start an exercise program in conjunction with this um, healthy eating plan, often 
the exercise will not be significant enough to build muscle. So if for a person's actually not seeing their weight coming down, usually it means that they're not sticking to the program. Don't assume that it's all of a sudden because they're starting to bulk up. Like we have to get away from, from that idea. So I'll tell you, you know, we always incorporate exercise in our programs. We know that exercise without weight loss has tremendous benefits for people, especially for blood sugar levels and blood pressure and, you know, your lipids and cholesterol and all those sorts of things, as well as quality of life. But we know that the exercise component of their plan is likely contributing a very small amount to this what's going in and what's going out. So that's important to keep in mind when we're tracking weight, that weight more than likely reflects compliance or the person's um, commitment to the eating plan more so than the commitment to the exercise plan.